Hi, I'm Pastor Dave, teaching evangelist with Lamb and Lion Ministries. Soon on the Christ and Prophecy TV show, we are starting a series in Daniel. To supplement this upcoming series, I want to highlight some critical nuggets so that you can get the most out of this prophetic book. You know, last week I posted about the theme of Daniel and some background information. This week, I would like to do a deep dive into chapter 7, which begins the prophetic section of Daniel. Chronologically, chapter 7 comes after chapter 4. The events in chapter 7 occur during the first year of the Persian king's reign, which we know is 553 BC. That means the events in chapter 7 occur 14 years before chapter 5. Nebuchadnezzar had been dead for years, and Daniel would have been in his late 60s. Chapter 7 is the first of four personal visions given to Daniel. They prophetically deal with the times of the Gentiles. And this vision parallels chapter 2. Chapter 2 and 7 reveal four Gentile nations, one succeeding the other, and the destruction of the fourth and last empire, well, that, that comes from the Messiah. And, and that will establish ah, the millennial kingdom. Now, in contrast, the vision in chapter 2 was given to a pagan king and was interpreted by, uh, by Daniel. In chapter 7, the vision is given directly to Daniel and the interpretation comes from an angel. In chapter 2, that provided the human perspective on the times of the Gentiles, whereas in chapter 7, this provides God's perspective on the times of the Gentiles. Uh, Daniel is confused by the vision, which is why he requires an interpretation. Uh, what he sees are four monstrous nations which will harm the Jewish people. These four Gentile nations will inflict great suffering upon the Jewish people. This is why they are described as being ferocious beasts. We do know the Jewish people will eventually overcome and their kingdom will continue. As the Babylonian Empire is concerned, that's coming to an end. And the 70 years of captivity is also coming to an end. So Daniel expects life to return back to normal. He will be shocked to find out that the suffering, the Jewish suffering, will continue well past the 70 years of the Babylonian exile. In chapter 7, the first 14 verses are broken down into two parts, the four beasts in verses 1 to 8 and the Ancient of Days in verses 9 to 14. The vision begins in verse 2, the great sea and the first of the four beasts. Verse 7 and 8 reveals the fourth beast and the little horn. Verses 9 through 12 is the Ancient of Days, which will be the second coming of the Messiah. And verses 13 and 14 is the establishment of his kingdom. The great sea in verses two and three was agitated. It was moved by the four winds of heaven. This means there was something more than natural movement going on. The winds swept across the sea and caused the water to be greatly disturbed. Now, often in scripture, the great sea refers to the Mediterranean Sea. However, the word sea is also used symbolically to refer to the Gentile world. We see that in Isaiah, Matthew, and Revelation. Because we know the theme of, of this book, the great sea in Daniel 7 represents the Gentile world. In, in verse 3, this is the four monstrous creatures rising from the great sea. The vision parallels the four empires of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. These four beasts refer to four Gentile empires. In verse 4, Daniel sees the first beast. In Nebuchadnezzar's dream, the first kingdom was Babylon, pictured as the head of gold. In Daniel's dream, the first kingdom is represented by a lion, the king of the beast. This is a symbol of Babylon. However, this was not a normal lion. It had eagle's wings. This is another symbol of Babylon. So says Jeremiah and Ezekiel. In Babylon, the famous Ishtar Gate had depictions of lions with wings. The lion represents the king of the beast, and the eagle represents the king of the birds. Daniel is shown something unique, a unique aspect of the lion. Its wings were plucked, meaning its downfall was assured. It was lifted up from the earth, it was made to stand on two feet like a man, and it was given a man's heart. This described Nebuchadnezzar's experience in chapter 4. Nebuchadnezzar was, was called a lion in Jeremiah 49 and 50. His army was known for its speed. Because of this, Ezekiel described him as having the wings of an eagle. Babylon's representation as a lion was for its great power. 
Its representation as an eagle was for its arrogance. Now, in verse 5, we see the second beast, which was a bear-like beast with three teeth in its mouth. This beast will parallel Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the two arms of chest of, and chest of silver. And, and this is one nation merging together from two nations, the Medes and the Persians. Persia becomes the dominant power, which is why Daniel sees the bear is raised up on one side, one side being stronger than the other. The bear is less majestic than the lion, and its bulky body is less graceful and agile. The bear moves slower than a lion, and that was true about the Persians, as they moved slower than the Babylonians. The decrease in speed was due to its large size. The three ribs in the bear's mouth represents three historical conquests, Lydia in 546, Babylon in 539, and Egypt in 525. Verse 6 is the third beast, which is a leopard with four wings on its back. This parallels Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the bronze belly and thighs on the statue. We know this is the Greek Empire. Jeremiah, Hosea, and Habakkuk tell us that. The leopard is less majestic than the lion and less grand than the bear, but it is faster than both. Its four wings would make it twice as fast as the two-winged lion, which is exactly what happened in history. Greece, under Alexander the Great, moved and conquered nations quickly. Within four years, Alexander the Great conquered the entire Medo-Persian Empire, including Egypt, Syria, and Israel. Within six years, he conquered more than 11,000 miles of territory, from Greece in the west to the border of India in the east. In addition to four wings, it had four heads, which represents the four generals who divided up the kingdom. The Greek Empire, which began as one unit, split into four divisions upon Alexander's death in 323, and two of those generals had direct influence over Israel. Now, the first three creatures were not animals, they were like animals. However, the fourth creature was so extraordinary that Daniel ref refrained from attempting to describe it. And there was something radically different about this beast. It was far more ferocious than the others. The fourth creature paralleled Nebuchadnezzar's dream of the iron legs and feet. The fourth empire underwent multiple stages, which are described in chapter 2. There was the United Stage, which was, which was fulfilled by the Roman Empire, then a two-division stage, and then a ten-horn stage, and a little horn stage, and then finally a ten-division stage. Daniel did not compare this fourth beast to any animal. It was said to be terrible and powerful and strong. It had teeth that would not conquer. Instead, it would crush every nation. It devoured and broke its enemies into pieces. Just as consumed food becomes part of the body, nations would become part of the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire was unique in this way in that it would conquer nations and then incorporate those people into its society. They freely granted Roman citizenship to outsiders in order to Romanize them and to turn them into willing participants versus becoming enemies. The Romans called this system divide and rule. Now, the ten horns on the fourth beast, that corresponds to the ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The last kingdom started out as one kingdom, Babylon, but then was divided into two, the Medes and the Persians, and eventually it's divided into ten. In verse 8, Daniel then sees an eleventh horn on the head of the fourth beast. This horn was much smaller than the others, yet it had strength. In fact, it uprooted the other ten horns. This horn was distinct in that it had human characteristics. It had the eyes of a man and a mouth speaking blasphemous things. Eventually, this little horn will remove three of the original ten horns. From verses 9 to 12, the focus of this revelation moves from earth to heaven and from the little horn to the Ancient of Days. Verse 11 reveals the destruction of the fourth beast. Daniel at this point is no longer on earth, but he sees into heaven. He saw the angelical court preparing to bring procedures in a heavenly courtroom. The Ancient of Days, which is a title which appears three times in Daniel 7, Psalm 55 speaks of God as one who sits enthroned from ancient times. His garments was white as snow, which represents his holiness. His hair was pure wool, which represents his purity. 
God's throne was made of fiery flames. In Scripture, fire represents the presence of God. We see a Shekinah glory in, in, in Exodus and in Deuteronomy, and we see it as a symbol of judgment in Deuteronomy and Psalms. Like Ezekiel, Daniel speaks of the fiery throne having wheels, and they too were burning fire. See, verse 10 moves into the topic of divine judgment. A river of fire was, was streaming forth before the Ancient of Days, emphasizing the courtroom scene. Angels were serving the Ancient of Days, and th there were so many angels, Daniel could not count them. They stood before the throne, ready to receive commands from God to carry out his judgments. Verse 11 moves into the destruction of the fourth beast, and verse 12 moves into the end of the three beasts. When the Babylonians, the Medes and Persians, and the Greeks were defeated, their dominion ended. The empire ceased, but the nation continued. The Babylonian empire ceased to exist, but the nation of Babylon continued. The Persian empire ceased to exist, but the nation of Persia continued. The Greek empire ceased to exist, however, the nation of Greece continued. But the fourth empire, this will be replaced by, glory to God, the kingdom of God. In verses 13 and 14, the scene shifts again from a courtroom to the description of Jesus' second coming. This description uh, is setting up the kingdom of God. Verses 13 is his second coming, and verse 14 is the messianic kingdom. In the book of Acts, when Jesus ascends into heaven, he, he does so with the clouds, Acts chapter 1. Verse 13 in Daniel 7 explains, in like manner, he will return with the clouds of heaven. Again, the term cloud represents God's glory. We see this in Exodus, 1 Kings, and 2 Chronicles. Daniel made two requests for an interpretation. The first request is in verses 15 and 16, and in verse 17 and 18, he receives the interpretation. The second request is for an interpretation is found in verses 19 to 22, and he receives that interpretation in verses 23 to 27. Verse 15 describes the effect that the four visions had on Daniel. Like Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 2, Daniel was greatly troubled by what he had seen. He became terrified by his dream. The vision kept alarming him. In verse 10, which is the heavenly court, Daniel approached an angel and asked for an interpretation, which the angel does provide. The angel explained the interpretation first deals with the kingdom of man. These great beasts or kingdoms emerged from the sea, highlighting their Gentile identity. And they originated from the earth, highlighting their humanity. This prophecy refers to human kingdoms ruled by man, not divine kingdoms. The angel established a connection between Daniel's vision and Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The four empires that King saw in chapter 2 were the same empires represented by beast in Daniel's vision. The angel's response did not satisfy Daniel's question about the fourth beast, especially about the little horn, which gave him the most trouble. Daniel wanted to know more about the ten horns and the emergence of this eleventh horn. In verses 19 to 22, he saw the little horn was waging war against the Jewish people, and for a time, it was successful and defeating them. However, verse 22 confirms the end of the little horn, which was guaranteed. See, when Rome conquered the Greek Empire, it did so with a united force. Later, this empire split into two, a Western and an Eastern power. But that first stage, it was united. This was the Roman Empire. What made it different from all preceding empires was its policy of imperialism. Meaning, when Babylon conquered other nations, it did not install Babylonians as rulers. Instead, the, um, the empire selected leaders from among the conquered people and placed them in positions of influence. When Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Jerusalem, he chose a Jew to rule over the providence of Judah, rather than a Babylonian. The Medes and Persians used the same strategy, choosing leaders from the defeated country. Zerubbabel is an example, being from Israel. He was appointed Israel's governor by the Medes and the Persians. Nehemiah is another example. They were Jews under Persian rule. Now, the Greeks utilized the same method. Under Greek rule, a Jewish high priest became ruler of Judea. 
the Romans, they changed this. They changed all of this. When they conquered a people, they incorporated them into Roman culture, but they placed a Roman authority over them. Pilate, Felix, Festus, these are examples of this. Rome instituted a new policy for dealing with conquered people. This policy is imperialism, and it's what made the fourth kingdom different from its predecessors. Verse 24 shows that the one world government stage will be followed by the ten division stage, which will be global. The ten kings will not rule in succession. If that were the case, the, the small horn would only need to subdue the last king. Verse 25 Verse 25 prophesies that he will speak against the Most High and oppress his holy people and try to change the set times and laws. The holy people will be delivered into his hands for a time, times, and a half a time. Here the angel provides some new information, information we wouldn't have if not for Daniel, regarding the little horn who will be the Antichrist. He will attempt to change the set times and the laws, meaning he will attempt to alter the biblical feast as did Joabam in 1 Kings, and he will also try to change the law, both civil and the law of Moses. The angel explains the, the holy people will be, will be delivered into the hands of the Antichrist for a time. This means the Jewish people, and at that time Christians, for three and a half years, or 1260 days, or 42 months, they will be delivered, be delivered to the little horn for persecution. This is the second half of the tribulation. Verse 26 promises the little horn will fall. Its dominion will be taken away and completely destroyed forever. Verse 27 confirms Jesus. Jesus will be the king and his kingdom will be eternal. Verse 28 reveals the impact the vision had on Daniel. He was still troubled. He kept everything in his heart, meaning he documented his experiences. But he did not share his thoughts. Well, I hope this little deep dive helped you. I'll be back next week diving into the next chapter of Daniel. So between now and then, all that we can do is look up and say, Maranatha, Lord Jesus. Uh -huh.